Hey, back in the studio again with our good friend Rick. Hey, I'll tell you what, Rick, you know what? You and I love to hunt. And this time of year, there's a little extra venison in the freezer. And you know, hunt season is right here. What do you do with the rest of the meat you have now? Because, you know, I don't like to let any wild game or any really meat sit in the freezer for more than a year. You know, you bring up a really good point, and I'm of the philosophy that I don't like to go more than a year on my meat in the freezer. And so it's getting to be hunting season right now. Bow season's open. Youth hunt has happened. And I'm starting to think to myself, man, I better start using up this meat somehow. And it's typically the hamburger that's the last thing that's left, in my freezer at least. Honestly, we eat the steaks in the summertime, right? You, right. Know, I, I, you know, the same thing here. And hamburger is one of those more universal items that we can, cat it. we can make a lot of things with it, if we think about it. So today we're going to show you how to make a sloppy joe mix using that, 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 that hamburger that you had maybe from late last season. Yeah. We're going to show you how to make some sloppy joes. And we'll tell you a little bit maybe later on about how to make some jerky out of it too. Okay. And we're going to actually can the sloppy joe mix right up, huh? Yeah. You know what? I've got a great recipe for taking your hamburger and making a sloppy joe mix. And like any type of canning, one of the things I really like about it is that when we're done, we don't need the freezer space. It goes right on the shelf. It's shelf stable. We can keep it there. And now we freed up that, 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 that freezer space for hopefully what we're going to get this, this fall. Right. I, that, I love that idea. Again, you know, freeing up that freezer space because, you know, if you're like me, you know, I love the fish in the fall a lot and ice fishing's around the corner. You got duck hunting, grouse hunting, you know what I mean, everybody. It's game on and I want to make sure I rotate through all my stuff and I can't think of a better way to do it than canning up anything that's left. Absolutely. So while we get started, and I'll okay. tell you how to make a really good sloppy joe mix, uh, here's what I like to do. Now, I, I'll take, and it depends on how I'm making my hamburger. Sometimes when I make my hamburger, I'm doing a 3-1 mix with it already. I'm doing, you know, three parts veni to one, you know, one part hamburger or pork. And today I'm going to tell you when we make sloppy joes, I like to mix it again. I like a little bit higher fat content when I'm right. making sloppy joes. It has more flavor to it. It's just, a, it's a, it turns out a little bit better. So I'm going to take some of that meat. And in this case, I have it right here. And we've already browned it up. We've got two parts of veni. I got one uh, and two parts of regular hamburger. Now, when I'm making my sloppy joes, I like to use hamburger. And you know, this is a constant debate whether you use hamburger, whether you use pork. Pork, right. And most time I use pork when I'm making my hamburger in the first place. And if I'm going to be browning it up and make something in the kitchen, I like that pork flavor a little bit better. But in this case, I recommend hamburger. I think it's a better mix to be able to, uh, or beef, and be able to do that. So basically, you're going 50-50. I'm doing 50-50. Okay. And that's what we have right here. Now, I also do drain the fat off after, after I make it. There's going to be plenty of fat left in there, but I do drain it off because you get a little bit better product. And right here, I did one yesterday. This is what it looks like when it's done. Looks good. Yeah, you know, and you'll notice you don't have a real heavy fat content I layer see right that. here. It just had a little bit, looks a little bit nicer, still tastes really, really good. And that's how I like to do it. Now, if you're the kind of person who likes that, hey, leave it in. You know, there's nothing right. wrong with that. But I like to do that a little bit, and the kids like it a little bit more that way too. I was just going to say that I know that from my wife or my kids, if it doesn't look good, you know what, and there's a lot of fat on top. I typically don't let them see it. And, you know, I go and grab it out of the pantry downstairs, yep. bring it up and heat it up right away so they don't see it. But you know what, I do like the flavor of it though. Me too. And, and honestly, if you've gotten through the field dressing already, that's not a big problem for right. anybody. Hey, but I, I, I like the way it looks. And you know, if you're going to bring it over to somebody's house, you're going to bring it to camp or do something like that, you want it to look nice. You yeah, know, you're proud of what, what you, you came up with. Absolutely. You know, that's the whole thing. When you spend all the time doing what you're doing, yep. you want it to look good at the end. So and it tastes good. So here we have uh, our four pounds ready. I've got some ingredients right here. I've got chopped onions. I've got green and red bell peppers. I have salt and pepper. I have celery, and I like that flavor of celery. Not everybody does, but I right. like that flavor of celery. Plus, celery can actually stay a little bit crunchy even through this process. That's what I like. And I like that when I'm biting into a sandwich, I have a little bit of that crunch, so I like celery for that. And what do you have there? You know, that's beef broth. No, what's, like, I gotta ask you, what, I've never used uh, beef broth in my venison making sloppy yeah. joes. Well, I'll tell you why I use it here. Because venison is so lean, I wanna add a little bit of beef broth to it. It's gonna take a little of that gamey taste away as okay. well, and it's gonna give it a little bit more flavor. So I like doing it. This is optional. It's gonna, but but I really do like the flavor. And matter of fact, on that same note, right here I have tomato soup. So when we get it all done, and I'll show you how we do this. Interesting. I top it with tomato soup to bring it right up to that headspace level I want. Okay. And that tomato soup has a lot of that tomatoey flavor to it, and so I like that too. Again, a lot of this is preference. You know, you can change it up. You can use tomato sauce. You can make your own stewed tomatoes if you have leftover from the garden and do it that way. But anything that tomato, that acidic tomato flavor, really goes well in a sloppy joe. 
Well, I'll tell you the other thing is too is like my wife, she she never grew up eating venison. Her dad was not a hunter, um, so she doesn't like any of that wild gamey taste at all. And by adding that tomato soup, I'm sure that takes away all, almost and the beef broth takes away pretty much all of that, huh? Well, I'll tell you what. Can I share a little story with you? Know, you? I'm, I'm listening all the time for stories. <laughs> well, well, you know, we've talked a lot about my grandparents, and I would get the lecture every time we go to someone's house for dinner that I wasn't supposed to bring up the fact that everything we were making had venison in it <laughs> because they weren't sure who liked the venison and right. who didn't. I personally loved it a lot, but you're right. Not everybody likes that gamey flavor. We've talked about when we process, we try to get a lot of that silver skin off. We try to process very cleanly so that we, we don't have as much of that flavor. But even with that, it is a wild game and you're already going right. to have some of that. And if you want it to just be universally accepted by your kids, by your wife, you're going to want to you know, mitigate that a little bit. And for me, I like it with a little less of that flavor in it anyway. I like it to taste like traditional sloppy joes. And quite frankly, this is a great way to use up your meat and make sure everybody enjoys it. You know, with me, Rick, too, a lot of times, you know, we'll have people over or we're up at camp. I won't even really mention to them that it is, you know, wild game. And it's amazing how people don't even, they don't even say anything. No. You know? But I, I fully expect if you're at camp, you're on board. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. For sure. But I'll tell you, it is because, you know, we get some people that just don't like to, the to flavor of mm -hmm. venison. And I think, you know, we've talked about this before. A lot of it is because it's never processed, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, I know we talked about that in another episode, but, you know, that proper processing, getting your deer cooled very quickly, taking the time to get that silver skin off. And we talked about, you know, big processors don't do that. They don't have the time to do that. That's a fact. And if you're doing it yourself, you have the time, again, back to taking pride in what you do. You can control a lot of those factors. And, hey, some people like that gamey taste. That's what they, that's what they grew up with. That's what they want. But if you don't like that or people around you don't like it, there are things you can do in your processing side to really mitigate that flavor as well. And hey, make sure you guys check out, we have a great deer processing video. You know, a lot of places aren't taking in venison anymore. Mm -hmm. And again, like you're saying, Rick, you know, when you do it yourself, you know exactly what you're gonna get. You're getting your own meat back. Yes. You know that it's been handled very well, even though there's a lot of great places still left that do venison and take good care of it. It's just always one of them kind of things where doing it yourself, you know, again, you know what the final product's gonna be. Absolutely, and, the, and there's so many factors that go into it, that good ethical kill, getting that field dressed right away, getting it cooled down right away, all those things have impact. If you do it yourself, you control the process all the way from start to finish, and even in, into here, there are steps that you can take when it's yours to make sure that it's done exactly how you want. And most people who are going to take the time to do this take pride in their work, and it's going to show in the flavor in the end. I agree with you. Well, I'm interested in this sloppy joe mix. All right. Well, we've pre-measured everything, so we're going to just go ahead and add the onions right here. And if a person likes a little bit more onion or a little bit yep. more pepper or a little bit more mustard, you know, obviously you can just add a little bit more in. That's right. And again, you make this a couple times, you'll find out what you like. And the one thing about canning, as we talked about earlier, is that the flavors really come through in different ways. Things like garlic become really, really strong in the canning process. Things like jalapeno peppers get stronger. So use a little bit less on the first try. You can always add more later. And again, salt and pepper actually act about how they normally act. So here again, we're adding There's a little no bit of salt. There. No surprises with salt mm. and pepper, but a few of those things that, the, especially those, I would say pungent flavors like garlic, they really, they, they really enjoy how that, how that goes in the, uh, in the canning process. So I'm kind of doing the dry mix right here, just kind of mixing everything in evenly. Kind of looks nice while you're doing it. And now I'm gonna add my broth on top of that. Okay. And after I got that broth in, I'm just gonna st just stir it a few more times like that, making sure it's evenly mixed. It looks good already. It does look good already. All right, we got that all set. So if you could hand me one of those jars. Certainly can. Now, one thing about your jars too that I recommend, uh, most of us have dishwashers, uh, and if you put it on just the jars, top rack, put it in the dishwasher, and set it to sanitize, okay? Wash it through, it does a really nice job of sanitizing the jars, getting them clean. Now you can hand wash them too, nothing wrong with that. Right. But that sanitizing that usually gets it up to that steam function and really gets things nice and clean. I do recommend that in, in the jar, especially if you're gonna reuse the jars. You can reuse the jars as many times as you want, as long as they're not cracked or chipped. Now one thing I'll say about the lids, lids are one-time use. That's it. That's it. Use okay. the lids one time and then discard them. 
uh, the, the collars, and these are the collars right here, they can be reused, but the lids are the only thing that you wanna buy new every single okay. year. Okay. All right, so we have our jar right here, and we have our canning funnel right there. Larry, if it's okay, I'm gonna hand you the spoon, I'm gonna hold the jar. Do you mind spooning a few of those in here? Sure. And again, what we're gonna do is try to come up maybe about uh, a little more than three quarters full. Okay. Rick, I don't know if you do this, but I've heard of people actually taking their lids or taking the rings, excuse me, taking the rings actually off them once they get them into where they're storing them. Do yeah. you recommend that or not? Well, it's really a personal preference. You don't, once it's sealed, you don't need the rings anymore. Okay. And so like what I'll do, I, I don't have as many rings as I have jars. Okay. And you know, I'll, that's, that's good. Right about, okay. right about there as perfect. Okay. Um, you know, one thing with the, uh, with the rings is that if, uh, they will rust. So if you dry them thoroughly, you know, wash them in case you have anything on them, dry them thoroughly and put yeah. them away, they're really only for the process it, itself. So now you see we're maybe about three quarters full here. That's about the right amount. And then I'm going to take my soup right here. I'm going to fill that up. So again, I have my head space in there. And on a quarter like this, I want about a half inch. Okay. okay. And that's it. Now, I've got, could you have me the green tool right there? Yeah. The, yeah. Yep. The debubbler. Um, if you notice, I'm going to go to my notch right there. I got the perfect amount of head space. And I'm going to just sort of stick that in there like that. And let that soup settle in. Okay. That is absolutely perfect. So you're, you don't really have to stir it up or anything. You're basically just trying to get the, any air that might be in there that's, out of there. That's correct. And actually, you'll see that I've dropped the levels in there a little bit. You have. Done that. Yeah, yep. quite a bit. So really, we did get a lot of air out of this particular one. So mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I'd like you to do. I'm going to add just a little bit okay. more on top. Just maybe one or two scoops in there. Yeah, well, maybe half more. Half like more? That. Yep. Okay. Perfect. All right. Still got good head space in there. Gonna drop this down inside. I'm gonna measure and I'm gonna add just a little bit of soup on top. All right, Rick, it looks like you're, uh, we're almost done with the mix right there. You got a couple more ingredients to put in there? Yeah, I like to add the ketchup and the mustard last. Okay. Again, it's a personal preference, but yeah. when you're stirring things up, it's e it just it's so it easier to stir. Stick, it huh? doesn't stick, right, exactly. Right. So we've got everything mixed up. We got the broth in there. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take this and just move this out sure. of the way. We've got our ketchup here, and I'm going to add about two cups worth of ketchup to this. Now, it's not an exact science, so that's about right right there. Right. And mustard's another one of those things where... You don't want, overdo it. You don't want to don't overdo, overdo it. it. So right. if you watch how I'm doing this, I'm doing it by eye. But like I you said before, you can always add more mustard to it. Yeah, that was about three tablespoons for, for this total. Okay. All right, now... Now I you're going to blend her up yep. good. Okay. Now it's getting pretty pasty. Yeah, now it's a little harder to stir, but I tell you what, you can really smell the flavors coming together. I it can. smells extremely good. And I just love onions, so that onion and the meat, just absolutely a fantastic smell. You know it's gonna taste delicious. You know, I think uh, a big thing in life, I always say that one of the best pleasures in life is good food. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I don't know about you guys and gals, but man, good food is, you know, and it, I, sometimes it's hard to find. That's why making it on your own and doing, you get it exactly how you want it. Exactly. Right? Yeah, if you're the one making dinner, you know you're always going to enjoy what's, what, what's for dinner. Yeah. Right? Exactly. All right, so we're ready to go. So I'm going to okay. grab one of these jars right here. These have been sanitized. We're going to take our canning funnel like this. And Larry, if you could help me sure. out. Sure. Why don't you fill that up about three quarters full, maybe a little bit more than three quarters full. Okay. And then when we get it that full, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add tomato soup right to the top to top it off. Okay. Looking good. Yeah, that is looking good. Now, one of the things you can do too, um, I like spicy. I think we've talked about this before. We both enjoy spicy. You can add red pepper flakes. You can add jalapeno. Maybe a half a spoon there more. That's perfect. Right there. Huh? Yep. Okay. Let's see how that looks. All right. Take this away. I'll tap that down. And you can add it to it and you know make it a little bit more spicy. I don't do it because I'm usually doing this for my family. and uh, Everybody's got a little bit yep. different. And you can always add that at that yeah. meal time, right? All right. I'm stirring that around. You know what? I'm going to want just maybe a maybe. spoonful more. Okay. Can you do it without the funnel? I think you can yeah, get I that. See how good I am. I don't know, Rick. Let's see. Perfect. Perfect. 
All right. Oh. All right. So we got that about three quarters full. I'm going to take my tomato soup. And go dump it right on top. Right there. on top. Now, again, we want that head space in there. And with a quart jar like this, we're going to want about a half an inch. Now, I'm actually going to go a little over that. Because you know it's going to work itself down. That's exactly right. So I'm going to take hmm. my debubbler, which doesn't mean they're taking the water fountain out of school. That's a Wisconsin joke. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And we're going to go ahead and we're just going to try to work that soup into the crevices down below. And what that's doing is getting the air bubbles out. Okay. There we go. And now we've got back to our half inch head space. And again, Perfect. we're going to go Boy, ahead and measure that. you had that dialed. That, that, that worked out really well. So there we go. Now, I've noticed that through this process too, I've gotten a little bit of soup on top. So if you don't mind grabbing a paper towel. Okay. It's important just to kind of keep everything clean. Exactly. So it seals better and That's looks better. And yep. So what I, all I'm going to do is I'm going to just take that towel. I'm just going to go around the top like that before I put the, the seal on or the lid on. There we go. Then I'm going to take my little magnet grabber and my pot of boiling water over here with my lids in it. And again, when we do that, when we actually, uh, when we boil the tops, one of the things we're doing is we're sanitizing the tops. But you see that red seal on the bottom right here? Mm -hmm. That seal right there, that's what's going to make the seal between the jar and the lid. Okay. And if you soften it up a little bit, it's going to get, you're going to get a better seal more the time, most of the time. Okay. And that's usually when, when you don't have, you know, when something goes wrong in canning, it's usually the seal that breaks and that top will pop up. And as a safety note, if you ever go and use, you know, take a product out and it's either, if it's a can and it's bulging, or in this case, if the top is popped, throw it away. Right. Don't, don't use don't it. Don't mess with that it. That means you've got a broken seal and you don't want to use that product. So again, one of the things we want to do is prepare that seal for, a, for so that we have the best possible outcome long term. So we have that on. We're going to actually take the collar right here. Okay. We'll put that on right like that. And I'm going to And how tight? It. How tight do you go? I'm actually going to go pretty tight. I'm going to go right where it's snug. Which is pushing down that seal, huh? Yep. I'm going to turn it about another eighth of a turn. Okay. Now I'm real tight. That's going to, that's going to take some, you know, some strength to get off. But I'm going to back that off that eighth of a turn again. What that does, that allows that top to kind of, I would call it burping. It allows the air to come out like a check valve, lets it come out during the canning process. But then when you're done with the canning process, it's cooling down. It's going to, it's going to suck back in. It's going to seal and create that vacuum. Okay. And allow that to be then shelf stable. All right. So this is all ready to go. If you don't okay. mind, put that in the canner. Piece of cake. Yep. Then we'll take that and we'll fill the other two, get them into the canner as well, and I'll show you the next step. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. One more? I'd say one more, yeah. Every time I think we got the right amount, it right. settles down pretty good. So let's see how we're doing. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about is um, altitude, because it makes a difference in canning. As far as the, the pressure cooker, yeah, it's, pressure it, canner, it, it, it especially relates to um, to uh, low pre low acid food, high pressure canning. Okay, um, you definitely want you know we're below a thousand feet here from uh, sea level. And I'll talk about how to, like we can how we can check that. I'll tell you what. Why don't we um, put another scoop in that one? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Since we have leftovers here, I'll just get a little scoop of one here. Joe, I would say that this is the right ratio on everything. This really is about perfect for four quarts. All right, set that off, I'll clean the tops. 
Joanne, if you want anything to drink, just feel gr free to grab whatever you want. Thank you. Hey, I'm having you move the paper towels a little bit. Okay, got it. And then just twist the canner a little bit. You got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Making me thirsty for a Bloody Mary. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it smells like, too. Now, just so you know, like if you're doing like if we just we'll can venison later on, you don't need to worry about putting liquids in or getting the air out and stuff like that. You really you don't. don't. You no. really not not for that now. Okay. But in uh, but in this, you really kind of do. You can uh, can breakfast sausage too. I was just watching a video on somebody doing that the other day, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, that is interesting. Yeah, because like even if you just again want to go to camp and you want a quick meal, um, pull that out and fry up an egg and an English muffin, and that's pretty good. All right, it look like we're pretty good. I'm going to add maybe just a hair of soup on this one. You know, one thing I do, too, about going to camp or anything, especially in my lifestyle, is that there's not a lot of time to make things to eat. I yeah. mean, it's especially like... Especially the so, mornings, yeah. Right, it is. Your you know, days, you get home late at night, and you mm -hmm. just want to have something good to eat where you can just pop, pop a jar out of the pantry and stick it on the stove or and nuke it, and ready, you're ready to go. Well, the easier, the better, too, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's gonna take this. Let me clean up my station a little bit. Thank you. All right, I got one collar here. I got one more over here. I did have a lid right here. I don't know if you want to throw it in the thing with the rest of them. Okay. All right, those are good to go. Okay. Okay, ready to fire back up? Still going. Okay. Hey Rick, so we've got the pressure canner basically all filled up, ready to roll. So where do we go next? Well, great question. So pressure can is a little bit different than water bath canning. Okay. We need eight cups of water in our canner. It's different for different canners, but ours needs eight cups of water, which we've already measured out. Since we already had our uh, mason jars here, that was pretty darn easy. And all we're gonna do is have you- uh, I'm gonna plug her in. Yep, plug yep. her in. Go ahead and pour right down the center, right, right in the middle. Right through the center, those. huh? Yep. Okay. Now you can do this ahead of time and set the jars in. You can do it now. It doesn't really matter. I kind of like to do it now so that if you're taking things in and out, you're not getting things messy while you're doing it. Makes sense. So these aren't covered all the way up. No, a matter of fact, you're just really kind of coming up part of the way on the, on the base. But the neat thing about pressure canning is that you're going to have a constant temperature inside that's really generated by the steam itself. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the canning itself and pressure canning. Altitude means a lot. So if you think about it, we have a column of air above us, uh, which creates atmospheric pressure. If we go to Denver, we're going to be up about 5,000 feet. We have less air above us, less atmosphere above us. Uh, we need to be able to compensate for that. So in this case, we are below 1,000 feet. We're sitting at about 700 feet. Here in Wisconsin. Yeah, here in Wisconsin, right. specifically yep. where we're working today. And if you ever want to find out where you're at, if you have an iPhone or even an Android, you can actually open up your compass, and at the bottom of the compass feature will tell you your altitude at the time. Look at that. If you're at 1,000 feet or below, and we're using a weighted, uh, what they call weighted rattler, that's what we're using right here. Okay. Uh, anything 1,000 feet below, you can use 10-pound weights, and that's what we have today. Our canner also comes with a 15-pound weight. So if you're above 1,000 feet, you can use a 15-pound weight. And what that does is that allows the internal temperature to rise above the boiling point. Right? Interesting. So normally we're at about 212 for boiling at, 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 at sea level, but one of the things we're going to want to do is we're going to want to get that temperature up there 
there to kill the, the, the spores that, that, that are actually what can create botulism within the food. So to do that, we have to get that temperature up above boiling for a, for a sustained part of, uh, period of time. In this case, we're going to can for 90 minutes, okay. and we're going to actually have that 10-pound weight, which is going to get us up in the high 230s to be able to do that. So I want you to set that to vent again on top, that rattler. Yep. Oh, actually, no, right on top. Oh, the, right here. Yep. yep. Okay. Set that to exhaust. You're going to line that arrow up with exhaust. Yep, just like that. Yep, perfect. All right. And now you had it right there. We're going to go here, and we're going to actually push the button that says high for high-pressure canning. Okay. And now if you can push and hold that button until it says 90, that's the plus on time okay. on the right-hand side. So basically you just press Push it. and hold, yep. You'll see that count up to 90. Oh, you're a little bit beyond. Oop. Then press and hold, and it'll come back down to 90. There you go, and just hit it a few more times, down to 90. Oh, now, that's easy enough. That's easy right. enough, that's it. Now if you're going to hit start, okay. we'll go ahead and do that now. Now, when you're canning, the first thing you're going to want to do, especially with, with high-pressure canning, you're going to want to vent the air. And that's, that's why we have it set to exhaust on top. So the air is going to be, as it begins to boil, steam is going to form, and it's going to begin steaming out of the top. So what we're doing is we're supersaturating that air with 100% humidity. All right, so we have as mm. many water molecules in the air as we possibly can. It's a really important part of canning is the venting process. We go for 10 minutes by doing that. Now this, our canner actually has a built-in timer. There's a sensor that's gonna sense when we're at boiling. It's going to then count down for 10 minutes and there'll be actually, say E10 for exhaust, 10 minutes. It'll count nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And when it gets to zero, we close that top to airtight. Okay. All right, again, that's a really important part of the process. You don't want to cheat that process, whether you're using our can or another, because the more saturation of, of water molecules we have in there, the better energy transfer we have to the food inside. Think about a warm day. If it's 80 degrees and no humidity, it's the most comfortable day you can imagine. If it's 80 degrees and 100% humidity, it just feels awful. Miserable. It, it's, right. a, it's all about the, the water molecules in the air and how they transfer energy to you in that case, or in this case, how they're going to transfer to the food and kill that, uh, those spores that could be in that food, making it shelf safe. So really important part of the process. When that's done, we're going to turn to airtight. It will then, there's a sensor inside, will sense the pressure is building. Once the pressure gets to the right level, it'll begin that 90 minute countdown. And we basically just gotta watch to make sure steam is coming out the entire time through the rattler. And at the end of 90 minutes, it will turn off and it'll cool on its own. When it's fully cooled, there's a little locking mechanism right behind that rattler. There's a little pin that prevents you from opening it while it has pressure inside. It's a safety item. Makes sense. And when it's done and it's fully cooled, that pin will drop back down. You'll be able to open the top back up and take the, the, the jars out. Now that takes a few hours for the whole process to, to cool down. Huh? Yep, it does. But it's also part of the canning process. The heating up, the maintaining temperature, and the mm -hmm. cooling down. All part of the canning process. I say this because, you know, some people, well, my grandmother did this or she did this. I'll tell you what, these are the established safe guidelines by the USDA, and you're going to want to follow them. Make sure that you allow it to heat up properly. You do the venting process. You allow it to process at the right temperature, and then allow it to cool down. All that's part of the process. You don't want to short any of it. Right. And it's sure, this certainly does simplify things, for sure. Right. The right. one thing that's I part I like about it. Yeah, the one thing I like is that if you're doing it, what I call a dumb canner, if you're using one of those canners that's, you know, the, the stove and the canner aren't really associated with one another. Well, not everybody sets the timer, remembers to set the timer at the right time. You're like, oh gosh, I think that I think right. that's been 10 minutes. In reality, it may have been five. Right. Yeah, you know, this does that for you and it's taking a lot of that guesswork out, allowing you to, you know, focus on again the cleaning up process while it's heating up, making it a little bit easier for you. Hey, you know, we talked about earlier, if you're making a dinner and why not make a double batch or a triple batch, feed your family, take that batch put it into some mason jars and can it. I do this with spaghetti sauce as well. Just like we're doing Sloppy Joe's today, right. you can do the same thing with a spaghetti sauce. And again, a great way to use up that venue you might still have in the freezer. It's a great way to make it shelf stable, use it at camp, use it for feeding the family on a quick meal on a night where you have sports with the kids. It just makes life a little bit easier. You know, I find myself, because uh, I like to binge eat, that I will eat, you know, like we're making Sloppy Joe's. So I'll eat Sloppy Joe's two or three days in a row. Now I don't want to see it for a month, you know, and that's the part I kind of like about that I love about the canning part is that obviously making these big batches yep. and going through all the processes, I can just 
can it up, put it back downstairs in the pantry. It's not taking up any electric at all right. in the freezer, not taking any room up. And, you know, again, when I feel like eating Sloppy Joes again, right back to it, pull them back out. Now, some people, I get asked from time to time, well, how should I store my items? Your best way of storing canned goods is keep them out of sunlight in a cool, dark spot. I like a root cellar. I have one in my home. It's out of the sun. Right. It's in the basement, so it's a little bit cooler. But the, really, the sunlight is the big key here. You don't want anything exposed to sunlight. And then I also get the question, well, how long is this safe for? That's Just, my question. I want to know that. Yeah. You know, there's there, there's different thoughts on the process. I don't think over a year. I, I And it's not just for the safety aspect because, you know, canned goods can last longer. It's about flavor too. Right. It's safety and flavor. Well, after a year, just like in your freezer, after a year, things start to not taste as good. You get a little freezer burn. In this case, it just might lose some of those flavors. We call them volatiles. And those volatiles will break down over time. It just won't taste as good. But I recommend a year is a good safe and you know you're going to have a flavorful product. But let me talk a little bit too when I take anything out of the pantry that I've been canned. The first thing I do, take it out, I'll look at the jar, make sure there's no cracks, I check my seal, make sure that top is still concave and it hasn't popped up, then I open it, then I can smell it. Now, the thing is, is botulism, which is what most people worry there's about. There's no smell to it. There's no smell to it, it right. doesn't smell. But if it's spoiled, you'll smell it. And spoiled food obviously smells. So you'll smell a bit for spoilage and things like that. But what you really look for, look for color, look for anything that looks out of the ordinary. And if it doesn't look right, don't, 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 eat, don't, it. don't eat it. Right. But the other thing is, is that I recommend, especially for a sloppy joe like this, you're going to put this into, you know, what I would do is I, I would take a pot just like this. I'd put my jar in there and I'd warm it up on the stove. You know, that goes a long way to killing any bacteria as well. So I recommend that, especially with meats, I like to actually either heat up or cook my meats even on the jar. Now, theoretically, you can eat them. It's really not a problem. Um, but I like my meat warm. And unless I'm eating jerky or something like that, and quite right. honestly, even with jerky, I like it warm. So, I mean, I will cook it up and, you you know, it just, to me, it tastes better. I would agree. You know, something too, and I don't know if you do this, Rick, but... I also, before I put my stuff in the pantry, I always take a little magic marker and put the date down on it. I do. I, maybe it's just me, but yep. I like to know. And I, I have to admit, I have eaten stuff that's been in the pantry for two, three, four years. You know, we did applesauce, I don't know, four years ago, and uh, we made so much of it. And again, you can only eat so much. But uh, again, you know, it's been in there for four years and I'm still eating it. But, you know, I really, when I take a jar out of there, 100% what you said, I really look at the product, yep. look at the, the, you know, the jar, the seal, and make sure that everything looks good. And the last thing I do is give it a little smell. Yeah. You know, and sometimes maybe just a little taste test just to make sure. Just to make sure, that, yeah. again, back to spoilers, make sure it tastes good. I mean, hey, if you're going to eat it, make sure it tastes good because nothing can ruin a good food that you like. Like, oh. like eating something that, that's turned on you. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I mean. I have that experience with milk, right? You go take that milk and it's it's gone south on you. I won't eat milk. Or I won't have my cereal for a month because of that. Right. You know, I, I think it's just a common sense goes a long way in whatever you're doing, but especially in food preparation, processing, preservation, a little common sense goes a long way. That's why keeping things clean is so important. You just think about it, you know, just a clean area is just like a good clean work area. You're less apt to have an accident. For That's sure. why I push that so, so much in everything that you do. Sanitization, making sure your jars are clean. You know, it may take a little bit longer, but again, back to pride in what you do, it pays off in the long run. It does. You know, and a lot of times, I don't know, I'm sure you're the same way, but a lot of times I make a lot of, you know, if I'm either if I'm canning fish or canning anything, I always like to give some of it away to people too. So I want it to look good. Yep. So obviously, you know, again, you take pride in what you're doing. Yeah, no, there's, and there's things too. You're talking about like, you know, how to, how to write things on. I'll write them right on the lid because again, that lid, you're not going to use again. Yeah, so if you write it right on the lid, you know exactly what you got going on right there, and you're going to throw it away anyway. But if you look right on the jar, well, you might reuse the jar right. again, and you don't want to get a mistake on there. So I'll do it in there. If you put tape on it, tape works great, but tape after a year, even if you're using blue painter's tape, it'll leave a residue afterwards that's hard to get off. So I like writing it right on the lid. Yeah, so to me, it makes the most sense. And we talked a little bit about you know the collars, whether you use them or not. Now, one of the things you can do is you can take the collars off after it's on can, put it on the shelves, like most of my tomato juices that way. Um, but if you want to give it to somebody, there's things you can do with those lids. You know, if you dress it up a little bit, um, I'll take a piece of flannel, 
like oh. a, from an old flannel shirt, I'll put it on there and yeah. you know give it away as a gift. You do stuff like that. To, and what I find with stuff like that is, you know, if I'm giving it to you and you took me out fishing, and I want to say thank you. It's like a gift. Exactly, but it's not a gift I went and bought, you know, at the store. It's a gift that I may have made for you, and I thought about you while I was doing it, or I thought about, hey, what does Larry like? Hey, I know Larry likes spicy food for sure. And it just it it, it conveys without having to talk about it. It conveys the thought that hey, I really appreciate that you spent the time with me today, or you offered to bring me to your camp. And I think those things go a long way. And uh, quite frankly, that just helps in the camaraderie. We don't have to we don't have to go deep into talking about it, but it shows my appreciation for what you've done for me. Yeah, I always like it when the neighbor lady brings over cookies. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I invite that neighbor lady every chance I get for that exact reason. Right. You know, but those things those are. I think some of that's lost art. It means a lot, and it's fun to do. And, and I, again, I like doing it with my kids. It's time, you know, my kids are so much on their technology. If I, I can with them, they were a big part of even developing this product with me. I like doing that with them. It's quality time spent together. And that is kind of the, I'm glad you kind of brought that up because canning is a, or can be a big family function, yeah. right? I mean, everybody gets together, yep. everybody's got their stuff to do. And it's certainly, especially when you're, you know, canning venison or you're canning tomatoes or pickles, you have a lot of stuff, products sitting there, and it's sure nice to get everybody together, yep. a lot of good conversation, but then everybody gets to reap the benefit at the end. Absolutely. And I find that when we're doing it, there's a lot of time like this where, hey, it's heating up. They're, you know, especially with the kids, they're kind of forced to talk to you. They're forced to have that conversation with you. And, you know, they're not buried in their technology. They're not doing other things. It's quality time spent together. It doesn't have to be your kids. Just be a buddy of yours that you get together with. And, man, it's it, it just fun to do something productive together and have a conversation at the same time. And I look back at my, you know, my childhood, and my best memories are doing this with my family. And, you know, for us, Black Friday was always a day after Thanksgiving where we processed deer. Yeah, I always thought right. Black Friday meant processing deer dear <laughs> you know and then I look back at it, some of my best memories everybody had a job everybody had something to do and at the end we had something more very basic we had our food for the winter and it was just a neat experience and I look back at that with nothing but fond memories yeah and here you know another thing is too is that anytime you can learn something in life especially something so important because you can't live without air you can't live without water and you can't live without food. Yep. So, right? Absolutely. Them are, so if you can learn how to can your own food, you know, and preserve things, just think about how much more ahead you are than a lot of other people, right? Well, again, I talk to my kids about this, and I talk about the confidence that comes with knowing that you can do it. And I don't care what it is. It can be processing. It can be building a house. It can be any number of things, but the confidence that comes with knowing that you can do it if you had to. It, it, it just, it builds a character within the person and confidence that goes through it beyond what we're doing today and food is such a basic thing right right you know it, it's ingrained within our dna to be able to provide for ourselves it, it just it's a great way to come together it's a great way to build confidence and it's something positive that you can do together awesome hey everybody i hope you guys enjoyed this canning process and uh, make sure you guys subscribe to our youtube channel down below appreciate that thank hey, you Rick, thank you appreciate it